Hi, welcome back to another edition of Jam and Men as we continue to read through the Bible, God's Word. We are in 2 Kings chapter 13. And in this chapter, we are going to discover, we're going to read about Jehoaz reigns in Israel, and then Jehoash reigns in Israel, and then sadly, the death of Elisha. The death of Elisha. And then also, we're going to be reading about Israel recaptures cities from Syria. Uh, but before that, before we get into God's Word, before we um, go to the Lord in prayer, there's just a little bit of uh, information here about God versus idols. And uh, this is what it says. It says, Why did people continually turn to idols instead of to God? And I think about that question, even uh, as valid even today. Why do people turn to idols rather than to God? Um, you even have people who claim to be atheists. You have people who say they don't believe in God. And why are they choosing to not believe in God uh, when God is evident? There's evidence of God. There's, um, and just look all around. Um, and instead you worship idols, statues. That doesn't even make any sense to me to be worshiping idols or statues. They're not going to do anything. They're just sitting there looking at you. You know, looking all nice and pretty. They're good for decoration. That's about it. They're not going to answer you. They're not going to respond to you. They're just statues. So, uh, this is what it says. Uh, it talks about idols were versus what God is. Idols were tangible. You know, I'm going to worship this golden monkey. I can feel it. I can see it. It's going to answer my every prayer. All hail the golden monkey. No. We're not going to hail the golden monkey. Tangible, right? Something you can see, you can touch. You're like, ah, there's the answer. The hand lies in that statue to life. No, it does not. Man made that statue. Man is flawed. Idols were tangible, whereas God is intangible, no physical form. You can't see God. We can't hear God. But yet God exists. And we see God, the evidence of God all around through his creation. Uh, uh, an illustration I use for that is you can um, you can't see the air that you breathe in, but it's there. You see the evidence. You're, you're you're living. You're alive because of the air that you're breathing in and out, right? Secondly, you see the evidence of air through the wind when it blows through the trees. There's the evidence there. God, you cannot see God, but the evidence of God is surrounds us from our very existence to stars in the sky you know God spoke and there they were <laughs> yeah God is intangible no physical form that we can see why because remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan and when Jesus came up up out of the river it said that the heavens opened up and God spoke. Why can we not see God? Because there's just like this dimension that prevents us from seeing God. There's this barrier. The heavens opened up. God spoke. When Jesus returns. The heavens are going to open up. And Jesus is going to come back. In all his glory. And every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And woe to that person who has not accepted Jesus Christ. Idols were tangible. God is intangible. No physical form. We cannot see God. People saw God when Jesus was here on earth, though. And even Jesus said, You have seen God because you have seen the Son. Of man, it was Jesus Christ Himself. Uh, I'm I'm paraphrasing that, 
It's in the New Testament somewhere. We'll read it in the months to come. <laughs> um, also, idols were morally similar, had human characteristics. Morally similar, had human characteristics. God is morally dissimilar, has divine characteristics. We were made in the image of God, yet we fall short of the glory of God. Why is that? Because of sin. What is sin? Again, sin separates us from God. That is why Jesus came to earth to die on the cross for our sins. So that we can live eternally for all eternity in heaven with him. God desires that relationship with us. But it takes two for a relationship to happen. And it takes two for a relationship to work. Now, I can't make my, my wife love me. I can't make my children love me. If I love my children and my children love me, there's a relationship. There's a connection. Same with my wife. If one does not love the other, there is no relationship. idols were comprehensible whereas God is incomprehensible idols were able to be manipulated God is not able to be manipulated worshiping idols involved materialism God is worshiping God involves sacrifice Idols were sexually immorality. God is purity and commitment. Now let me tell you, there's a lot of sexual immorality in this world. Tons of it. Everywhere. Purity and commitment? I see very little of that. God is purity. God is commitment. And if we are to mirror God's, the characteristics of God, then we need to strive for purity. We need to strive for commitment. And not follow the ways of this world, which will lead us to destruction and all damnation and hell. Idols were doing whatever a person wanted. Doing whatever a person wanted. God is doing what God wants. God is God. He's, he's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's all God. God says, I am that I am. Idols were focusing on self. A lot of people in today's world are focused on themselves. Only. God is focusing on others. Are you as a child of God focusing on other people? Or are you focused on yourself first? And that includes your family. Are you focusing on yourself? Just yourself? Only? Or are you focusing on other people? Are you focusing on your spouse? Are you focusing on your children and their needs? Family has to come second. God needs to come first. Are you focusing on God? And the only way we're going to be focusing on God is if we're praying on a daily basis, if we're reading His Word on a daily basis, if we are doing what God has called us to do, if we're applying God's Word in our lives. God first, and family must come second. And all else.
else will fall into place. But family is very important. But God is, above all, the most important. We need to focus on others, not ourselves. Idols, we're focusing on self. And we see a lot of that today in today's world, where people are focused on themselves, they're being selfish, they're being greedy, and it's all about me, 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 I want, I want, I'm going to take. I mean, just look at all the people that are going into stores these days and stealing. They're only thinking about what they want. And they're going to do whatever they can to take it. It's mine. That's this this caused chaos and mayhem in the city. That's what's happening. But he who is in Christ knows better and will do their best reaching out to those who are in need. That concludes God versus idols, by the way. So now let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Heavenly Father, help us to um, be aware of others people, other people's needs uh, and help us to focus on you and you alone. Not on idols, not on the things in this world or even the ways of this world, Lord God, but help us to focus on your ways and focus on you, what you have done, what you have accomplished, and what you're doing in the midst of your people as we live our lives on a daily basis. What a struggle it is in today's world. So much sin abounds. And I know one day your return is imminent. It's going to happen. And a lot sooner than we think. But God, I know and I have my I have that blessed assurance in you, Lord God. Place my faith and trust in you, knowing, Lord God, where we will end up as your people, as your children, where we will end up for all eternity. And that is with you in heaven. I lift up those who have not yet received your Son. Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Help us to be that light in this world, Lord God. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I lift up my viewers for you, Lord God, to you, and I thank you for them. Praying, Lord God, that you continue to bless them, and uh, um, God, you provide for our needs, and I know, Lord, you're providing for their needs. That even when... Um, there's pain and str struggles in their lives. You are still there. So I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in the midst of our pain. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in the midst of our struggles. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in the midst of our hurt. Thank you. Your word, Lord God, says we are to be thankful in all things not easy to do. I've been there, going through it, but I still thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in my own life. And it's through your Son's holy, precious name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, that I give you thanks and praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's get right into it. Chapter 13, 2 Kings. Verse 1, in the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Uh, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazel, Hazel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, all their days. So Jehoaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Never 
Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them, and the wooden image also remained in Samaria. For he left for he left of the army of Joaz only fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten uh, thousand foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust of threshing. You see, they're still following and giving in to the idols that they've been worshipping. And today, we cry out to the Lord, and yet we fall back to our idols. What is our idol? What is your idol? You know, it could, um, idols in general. Uh, it could be drugs, alcohol, pornography. It could be um, gossiping, uh, pride, um, being selfish, greedy, uh, comparing yourself to other people. No, we need to be comparing ourselves to God. Remember? The God's word says, no one is perfect, no, not one. And yet Jesus calls us to be perfect as he is perfect. And the only way we're going to be as perfect as Jesus is perfect, which will never happen here on earth, by the way, but we can become do, uh, get as close as possible. And that is by reading God's word, by applying God's word in our lives, by doing the will of God in our lives, focusing on others rather than ourselves. And uh, that's what's happening here. They're continuously going to their idols. Um... And in some countries, they're, they're worshiping, you know, the golden statues that they've made from their own hands. This, this little monkey here was created by man. The golden calf was created out of human hands. Humans are flawed. Every single person on the face of this planet is flawed. And yet they continue to turn to their own wicked ways for being selfish remember what, what, what did it say that it's focusing on self that's what they're doing when they're turning back to their idol they're focusing on self because why because it's tangible I can see it it's going to listen to me eventually <laughs> same is true with God God will listen God will answer and God will deliver Verse 8, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoaz, all that he did, uh, and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Joaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. Verse 10, this is where Joash reigns in Israel now. So in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Joash, the son of Joaz, became king over Israel and Samaria, and reigned sixteen years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Gee, I wonder what he did. He did not depart from the from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nobat, uh, Nebat, uh, who made Israel sin, but walked in them. They're continuously walking in their sin, in Jeroboam's sin. I mean, Jeroboam. <laughs> wow. And sin abounds today. And we're walking in it. We're swimming in it. Verse 12. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did and his might, uh, with which he fought against amazing, uh, I'm sorry, amazing, Amaziah, king of Ju Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash rested with his fathers. Then Jer Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now we come to the sad part. The death of Elisha, verse 14. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and uh, take a bow. Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself uh, a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window. And he opened it. 
Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek, till, uh, till you have destroyed them. Then he said, Take the arrows. So he, so he took them. And he said to the king, So he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. One, two, three. And he stopped. Verse 19, And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike only uh, Syria only three times. Then Elisha, then Elisha died. And they buried him, and the and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down, and torched uh, and touched the bones of Elisha, uh, he received. Uh, he received. I'm sorry. He received. He revived and stood on his feet. Whoa. Israel captures cities from Syria. Verse 22. And Hazel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz, but the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and guarded them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them. And ca or cast them from his presence. God has compassion on his people even today. We may fail God sometimes, but God never fails us. How do we fail God? We're actually failing ourselves when we turn back to, to our sins. Or, or, we, or we say, you know, don't include God in, in our situations. We're failing ourselves. We need to Focus on God. Turn to God every single day and every single situation. And yet God has compassion on his people. Even today, when we turn our backs on God, God still has, his com has compassion on us. Verse 24. Now Hazel, king of Syria, died. Then Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And Joash, the son of uh, Joaz, Joaz uh, recaptured from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Joash, his father, by war. Three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. And now... It's time for the study notes. Verses 4 through 6. I'm going to let you go ahead and reread those on your own. I'm going to jump right into the study notes for those verses. Uh, this is what it says. And again, this is verses 4 through 6. It says, The Lord heard Joaz's prayer for help. God delayed his judgment on Israel when they turned to him for help. But they did not sustain their uh, dependence on God for long. Are you depending on God? Is God's people depending on God? We should. Every day. Although there were periodic breaks in their idol worship, there was rarely um, evidence of genuine faith. Do we, as God's people, have genuine faith? You know, we're good at talking the talk, aren't we? But are we walking the walk? Are we displaying genuine faith? It is not enough to say no to sin. It's not enough to say no to sin. No sin. Don't do that. Of course, when you're saying that, you're looking at yourself in the mirror, right? Yes, we must say no to sin. Yes. But that's not what it's saying here. It's not enough. It's not enough to say no to sin. 
we must also say yes to a life of commitment to God. A life. Say yes to a life of commitment to God. An occasional call for help is not, uh, is not a substitute for a daily life of trusting God. It's not enough to uh, call out to God just every once in a while. We need to be calling out to God on a daily basis, folks. Every day. Verse 5, I'm going to go ahead and reread that. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. And that's what it says in the study notes. It says, Syria, which lay uh, to the north of Israel, was always Israel's enemy. This was partly because Israel blocked most of Syria's trade from the south. And Syria cut off most of Israel's uh, from most of Israel's from the north. In one nation, uh, if one nation could conquer the other, all it all its trade routes would be open and its economy would flourish. Israel and Syria were so busy fighting each other that they didn't notice the rapidly growing strength of the Assyrians uh, to the far north. So both nations would be surprised, which we'll read in verse or chapter 16. And chapter 17. Uh, verse 9 and 10. Again, so Joaz rested with his father, so and they buried him in, the, in, in Samaria. Then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. And uh, uh, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of jo Joaz, so Joash, the son of Joaz, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 16 years. And this is what it says in the study notes for those two chapters. I keep saying chapters in those two verses. It says, <clears throat> Joash, also called Joash, jo Josh, Joash, Jehoash, also called Joash, assumed the throne of Israel in 798 B.C. We have dates, we have evidence. Again, that the Bible is, is a history book, literally. It has the dates, it has it, and people don't want to believe in God's Word. It's a history book, for crying out loud. Why aren't we teaching the Bible in the, in the schools these days? Because we're afraid of offending people. Stupid! No! We need to be teaching God's Word again. Carmen sang a song one time that, uh, how'd it go? Okay, I forget. I'm going to look it up, and I'm going to sing it. Bring it up in another video. Okay. Carmen sang another song pertaining to God's word. We need God in America again. That was part of the song. But there's more to it and it involved. Yeah, anyways. Okay. So, 798 B.C. And it says, At that time, the king of Judah, jo Joash, uh, was nearing the end of his reign. In Hebrew... Uh, Joash and Joash were two forms of the same name. <gasps> Excuse me. Thus, two kings named with the same name, uh, one in the south and one in the north, reigned at approximately the same time. While Joash, Joash of Judah began as a good king, jo Jehoash of Israel was evil. Verse 14. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, uh, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. This is what it says. Elisha was highly regarded for his prophetic powers and miracles. On Israel's behalf, Joash called him the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. This recalls the title Elisha gave to Elijah in chapter 2, verse 12. Joash feared Elisha's death because he described the nation's well-being to Elisha, 
rather than to God. Joash's fear reveals his lack of spiritual understanding. At least 43 years had passed since Elisha was last mentioned in Scripture. Chapter 9, verse 1. Okay, now there's uh, verses 15 through verse 19. I'm gonna, again, I'm going to let you reread those. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the study notes. This is what it says. When Joash, when Joash was told to strike the ground with the uh, arrows, he, didn't, he did it only half-heartedly. As a result, Elisha told the king that his victory over Syria would be, not be complete. Receiving the full benefits of God's plan for our lives requires us to receive and obey God's commands fully. If we don't uh, follow God's complete instructions, we should not be surprised that His full benefits and blessings are not present. Well, there's no surprise there. Are we following God wholeheartedly or are we following Him half-heartedly? Are we striking the arrows down on the ground three times? One, two, three. Or are we striking the arrows down as many times as it takes to follow God? All right. And then finally, verses 20 and 21. That's what it says. Then Elisha died, and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was they were, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Ooh, talk about miracles and miracles, huh? It says Elisha was dead, but his good influence remained even causing miracles. This demonstrated that Elisha was indeed a prophet of God. It was it also attested to God's power. Remember I, I mentioned that even though Elijah and Elisha were prophetic and not only did they perform miracles, um, it wasn't them and them alone. It was God's power. It was God it was what God was doing in, in the midst of Elijah's life, in the midst of Elisha's life, it's God. God needs to be the one to take the credit. It's God's power, not man's power. And it also attested to God's power. No heathen idol ever raised anyone from the dead. No heathen idol. No monkey did not raise anything from the dead. No calves, no golden calves, no Baal didn't raise anyone from the dead. They don't have that power. As a matter of fact, they don't have any power. Other than their beauty, perhaps? Nice to look at. Uh, it says, This miracle served as one more reminder to Israel that it had rejected God's word as given through Elisha. And that concludes chapter 13, folks. We are, uh, in today's world, it's, it's, we're living as the people did back then. Man is living, man is living as they did back then. Uh, where they've given in to sin, uh, and they fall back into their sin, and... They're worshiping their sin, basically. Whatever it is. It could be movie actors and actresses, singers, you know. It could be their their uh, temptations in life. Whatever it is. And again, I always go back to John chapter 5. Remember John chapter 5? Only a few videos. A few, yeah, a few videos ago. John chapter 5. What happened in John chapter 5? Had to do something with uh, Jesus approaching a lame man. And he asked that, that critical question, that crucial question, crucial question 
Do you want to be made well? That question applies today. He's still asking that question and you must respond. Do you want to be made well or do you want to continuously fall in to your sin? Do you continuously want to worship your idol? It could be your cell phone. It could be your computer. It could be whatever it is in your life. Do you want to be made well? Yes, I do want to be made well. The power of God. Then rise up and take up your bed and walk. And immediately he stood up, rolled up his bed and walked. And he didn't walk toward the pond. He walked away from it. See, he had been healed. And he's, Jesus sees him in the temple later on. And he approaches him and says to him, See, you have been made well. He points out that he's been made well. Now sin no more. It was that man's sin that causes him to be lame in the first place. Lest a worse fate fall upon you, come upon you. Lest a worse thing come upon you, is what he says. So, going back to Elisha, and Elisha, in Elijah's days, man kept falling into back into their sin. Today, man keeps falling back into his sin. I don't want to sin. I want to be made well. The power of Jesus. And I cry out, holy, holy, holy is his name. I want to be made well. Do you want to be made well? Then turn to God. Cry out to him. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, says Jesus. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am the way to my heavenly Father. I am the way to my heavenly kingdom where you will live for all eternity, forever. I am the way. I am the truth. Listen to me as I speak. For God's truth shall not go void. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus says, I have come to give you life that you might have it more abundantly. Not just in heaven, but here on earth as well, folks. Do you want to be made well? Then get up and walk. Roll up your bed and walk. And sin no more. Unless a worse thing come upon you. Those are Jesus' words to us today. Do you want to be made well? Then sin no more. Roll up your bed and walk. Toby Max song, marching, we're moving, onward and upward, power of God. Anyways, I'm probably not singing that song verbatim, but it's the, the word's still there. Do you want to be made well? Or do you want to continue and stay in your box, in your comfort zone, as it were? And only you can answer that question. I know what my answer is. My answer is, I want to be made well. And I'm getting up, and I'm walking. I'm picking up my bed, I'm rolling it up, and I'm walking. And I'm not going to sin no more. Easier said than done. But I'm going to strive for that perfection in my life. As all believers should be doing. We're not perfect. But we can strive for that perfection. Which Jesus calls us to. Remember. There's no one perfect. No not one. but be perfect 
as I am perfect, Jesus says. And the only way we're going to accomplish that is if we do our best to be as perfect as we can. That includes us picking up our mats, picking up our beds, rolling it up, and walking and sin no more. The lame man immediately rolled his bed up and walked, got up and walked. That's what it says in John chapter 5. He immediately stood up, rolled up his bed and walked. He believed. He placed his faith and trust in what Jesus was saying. We need to do the same. We need to immediately stand up, roll up our bed, and we need to walk. And of course that's not being exact. We're not in the lame man's situation. We might be. We might be in the, a, a lame person who can't walk. Do you want to be made well? Then get up, roll up your bed, and walk. And sin no more. That's the worst thing come upon you. We all need to do that. We all need to hear that. We all need to be reading God's Word on a daily basis. We all need to be praying on a daily basis. We all need to be uh, inquiring of the Lord on a daily basis. My life is not about me. Your life is not about you. Our lives are about God and what He's doing. In the midst of our lives, in the midst of our situations, in the midst of our situations, our struggles, whatever it is that we're going through in life, God's there. All we need to do is call out to Him, cry out to Him, and then sin no more. Anyways, well, this is Jam Man. I think I've taken up enough time. I'll see you again in the next video where we'll, we, we will be reading chapter 14, which is Amaziah reigns in Judah. And it's going to be a, probably a two parter. We're going to be talking about kings to date and, and their enemies. So that'll probably take a few minutes to read. Anyways, remember, God loves you. Jesus loves you. Holy Spirit loves you. I love you. Now get up. Roll up your bed. And walk. And sin no more. This is Jam Man signing off for now. You guys take care. God bless you and your families. Peace.